When we went to the beach, I told you I was going to come out. I'm fine. I promise. Not very good at keeping your promises, are you? I'll find him. I promise. You're the one who said we'd always put our friendship first. You promised. A restaurant, that's a classic date location. Why would you use an actual canvas for this? That's so wasteful, and those things cost money. So, a theme park. But you hate roller coasters. Quote from production designer Karis Beard about the art room. Again, we were trying to amp up the heat and the warmth of the colors because we're in summer now. We added flowers to the tree on the wall as well. Apparently there was a deleted scene filmed in the art room as well. Quote from production designer Karis Beard. This time we have a flashback in there which is actually quite an unhappy memory. We duplicated the tree on the floor from season one and made all the roots gnarly. I wonder what that would have been seeing how the art room has been presented as such a safe space for both Charlie and Elle. It would undoubtedly have to do with the bullying and or eating disorder. No clue where in the season that would have been though. Isaac's lunchbox is mostly eaten while Charlie's is full. Oh, what if you go to a bookshop and like choose a book for each other and have a cute little reading date? Isaac, that's your dream date, not Elle's. We must protect Isaac at all costs. Charlie, what do you and Nick do for dates? I mean, we went to the beach. Oh, basic. <laughs> the disrespect! This is a top tier first date. All I got as a teen was a guy sitting next to me in a restaurant booth so he could feel me up while ordering a two person meal I couldn't even eat so he would only have to pay half of it. What else? I've been grounded and he's got exams, so I've barely seen him outside of school. Oh my god, you're all useless. Tao, you're really overthinking this. I'm not. If this date doesn't work out, then I lose my best friend in the whole world. Or maybe you just go on a better second date? What about if we went to Ikea, like in 500 Days of Summer? Hmm? Maybe don't get your dating ideas from a movie that is about how idealizing a person and not seeing them for who they are is a disaster. This movie is pretty much an anti-romance. Cute date idea though. Funnily enough, Nick is revealed to have a celebrity crush on Zoe Deschanel in the Ethics of Infatuation Dynamics mini comic. Zoe, Otis, Christian, Nick, collect the cones. Charlie, can you collect the rugby balls, please? Do we really need this many people to get that done, or is this just a very convenient gathering of relevant characters so we can have this scene? You hear we're having an end of GCC party in the woods next week. And you guys should come. Nick, man, we're not friends of Harry them not anymore. We're sorry about what happened at the cinema. We should have spoken up. They were visibly uncomfortable, though, as previously established. Thanks. I do know you're not like Harry. Guess it took me a while to realise what a dick he is as well. I, I seriously don't blame you for fighting him. I know you and Charlie are really good mates. Bombastic side eye. The G is missing the yellow highlight until it starts to pop. Um. This was so funny in the comic. I'm so glad they did this in the show as well. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you say that? I so wish we could have had these little moments with the lads in season 1, but I get why they were cut, and I'm so happy we got a bit of them this season. It's no secret I'm obsessed with the lads. They're so funny. Still couldn't come out to any of them. The door! Is. Open it! Like, it's fine, there's no deadline. I know, but it's just annoying when people think we're, like, Best bros. <laughs> Supportive straight friends. I'm gonna tell some of the rugby guys at least. If I don't come out of school soon, we're probably gonna get found out anyway. The real question is, how have you not been found out yet? Look at all this gay behavior. Blatantly gay. In public. In front of everyone. All the time. How? Because you keep wanting to kiss at school. Uh I think you're also to blame for that. I don't know what you mean, I have never <laughs> initiated a kiss Oh, school. really? So, what about the changing room? I didn't count. Or the English room? You kiss me first. Or what about the... 
Fine, you win. <laughs> Boys, I need... You wanted to see me? Come and sit down, Nick. I appointed you captain last year because you were the only one who could make these boys into a team. In the comic, this scene was actually where she made him the captain. On the show, he's been captain all along. But this term, I've sensed some distance has grown between you and most of the lads. Did you ever have a talk about this? And how awkward was it? I don't want to make any assumptions, but I assume this has something to do with it. I guess so. Poor Nick thinks he's getting scolded for smooching. If any of the lads say anything out of line, you tell me immediately, alright? Yeah. Yeah, I will. When I was at uni, things were pretty bad. That was in women's rugby. Lots of lesbians in women's rugby. That's how I met my wife. A lot of gay people are good at sports, Charlie. I remember what it was like, telling all my friends. None of the guys know about me, so, um... Well, you don't owe them that information, okay? And, uh... Maybe keep the kissing outside of team practice. Charlie? Still waiting on your coursework essay? It's nearly done. You have until the end of the day. He hasn't worked on it at all. Last episode he said he had weeks to finish it. He almost got started working on it before the park. He said to tell he's been busy with coursework. I'm stuck at home doing my history coursework. If he had just done this essay, he could have hung out with Nick this whole time. Weeks, apparently. And now it's the due date and he hasn't started. Like, I get procrastinating, but wasn't Nick motivating enough to just do it if you can do it in a day while at school? Okay, yeah, this issue is not that simple. Executive dysfunction is a thing, I know it very, very, very well myself. And Charlie's school performance slipping is a hint that he's not doing as well mentally as he claims. But still, you spent weeks nickless for this. I don't want to do this anymore. The school library was filmed in Burnham Library. Let's go over ionic compounds. What about your history coursework? I haven't helped you with that at all. It's fine. It's done. You are amazing. Shh. Ionic compounds. James, isn't it your last exam today as well? James McEwan, played by Bradley Riches, was a very minor one-scene character in the comics, but his role is expanded in the show. I already spoke in Deep Dive 8 about the fans theorizing the random kid who talks to Mr. Ajayi might be James, and it came true. So, aren't you gonna tell Nick Nelson that he has to do the match? Quote from Bradley Riches. When I was doing my one-liner, I obviously didn't know it was going to escalate into another character in season two. I'm here with... Bradley, and I play James McEwen. Hey, Isaac. Oh, hi, James. Um, describe your character with three emojis. This one, like the nerdy one. Yeah. A book, and <laughs> that one. Because I got the part really late, and like, you already, already did a read-through of the whole season yeah. before I even found out I was playing James. Um, but obviously we met on season one when I was there for one day. Um, so we had we already had that connection, like the familiar face, when we did our chemistry read. It was such a whirlwind. It, yeah. like, it all happened so quickly that you getting the part that we didn't have much time before the shoot actually started. But, you know, it's so easy to be friends with Bradley. And especially <laughs> when you're in an environment like you still on set and you're... <laughs> with each other all the time for really long days, yeah. Bradley Riches is a vocal advocate for autism representation and has written a novella called A Different Kind of Superpower based on his own experiences of life with autism. When sent a screenshot from Alice Osman's Patreon Discord Q&A on September 1st, 2023 of her responding to a question about whether there will be neurodiverse rep in Heartstopper, James had this to say. Hello, my name is Bradley Riches. I play James McEwen in Hearts of a Season 2. Growing up as a gay autistic person, I always found it hard to navigate myself 
in a world that was fit for neurotypical people. Uh, I think this was due to me not fully understanding myself, be it in my sexuality or me being an autistic person. I think this was also down to me not seeing myself represented in a character. Like I never saw an openly gay autistic character um, in anything I've seen, which made understanding myself even more difficult. Um, Cause I just thought I was strange. And obviously like the bullies didn't help either. It wasn't intentional, but like a lot of people have said that they identify with my characters and see them as being autistic. Um, and I'm like so up for those headcanons, like absolutely, if you want to see any of my characters as being autistic, then 100% go for it. Um, so, yeah. Yep. <laughs> I should probably be doing some last minute revision right now. But this <laughs> is more fun. It's quite a power move showing a pride display in a school library in Heartstopper, considering how many schools have banned Heartstopper from their libraries. I know that Mr. Ajayi would be like, uh, sorry to swear, f your rules. He'd be like, no. If they tried that here, he'd be like, oh, okay, and would absolutely carry on. In fact, he'd probably be a bit bolder. Um, he may end up getting fired, but I don't, I can't imagine there being a world where he would um, follow a rule like that. Let's go through all the books on display here. <sighs> here we go. Did you know? 1981 was the year that... Alice Osman and Mason Deaver are friends, and Alice has drawn this illustration of the characters from I Wish You All the Best. Isaac's own book here is Night Sky with Exit Wounds by Ocean Wong. It's an LGBT poetry book about romance, family, memory, grief, war and melancholia. That was a lot of books. Let's finally move on. Oh, have you read this one? Of course I've read that one. It's one I <laughs> Hold on. So I downloaded different subtitles than the ones on Netflix because I need to have the episodes with and without them, but the Netflix version of this scene says this. Oh, have you read this one? Of course I've read that one. It's one I <laughs> The line is definitely, it's not that good. I was thinking it was funny he would say it was one of his favourites because... Well... Not the off-brand wiki, how? Hey everyone, you might have heard this song in Heartstopper Season 2. That song's called Retrospect and we're called Vistas and I'm going to tell you how the track came about. So back in August 2017... Apparently you can't use a pencil in real GCSEs. You have to use a black pen. Also you can't just leave once you're done in real life exams. You have to stay until you're dismissed and you're not allowed to talk until you're out. Also apparently the GCSEs have a specific order and chemistry wouldn't be last. Seriously, how long did it take him to write that? And did he not have other classes? I am end of GCC's party in the woods near my house tonight! Yeah! And make sure you bring your GCC notes so you can burn them! Woo! Alice has got some amazing scripts for us. It also feels like, you know, cool and fresh, it's a different vibe to uh, season one. 
Try to give us more of a journey this season. The story is a bit more again? mature, and we're going again. Party tonight! Everyone bring your own drinks, yeah? I can't believe you brought this with you. I didn't. What's in your pocket? I swear to God. Take out everything that's in your pocket. Ben walks past looking most seriously displeased. Je m'appelle. Je m'appelle. Ça va? Paris is basically like a five day long sleepover. You're gonna be so annoyed with me after that. I love you because of how annoying you are. I mean. Uh, I didn't mean that in an I love you way, that, that was just a casual I love you. It's not me asking you to say it back or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so I think Rob should be fan by me. So there was some drama in the Heartstopper fandom on the 14th of September 2022, seemingly day 3 of shooting season 2, because the episode 2 park scene was seemingly shot September 12th and that was day 1. An extra posted a vlog about filming season 2 on TikTok. The TikTok was taken down the same day, but it had already spread absolutely everywhere. The fandom was not used to leaks yet, so everyone was talking about it and how this extra was definitely fired for it. Leaks became a big problem for the production throughout filming season 2, but this was the last time a cast member posted one. Heartstopper season 2 being in production wasn't announced until September 22nd, so a week after the leaked videos. So obviously production was stressed about videos already spreading, showing the actors in costume, where they were shooting and which characters had scenes together. Alice and Patrick were liking tweets telling people not to spread or talk about leaks. I don't support people posting behind the scenes spoilers of unreleased content, but I feel like since it's out there already and the show is now out, I can include it in this project because it's not spoiling anything anymore. Some people posted their videos and pictures of shooting after the show was out and that is infinitely better. Book lovers. Isaac's book is in fact Book Lovers by Emily Henry. Now this is a very popular one at the moment. This is an enemies to lovers contemporary romance. No LGBT themes this time, but very thematically relevant to how James and Isaac are both book lovers and James is clearly trying to make a romance happen. Also, I must point out that this is an adult romance novel. It only has one explicit sex scene, but plenty of spicy moments for a 15 year old to be casually reading this out in the open. I hope Isaac wasn't reading the sex scene or the skinny dipping scene at school. And um, this is Sahar. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet Hi, you. Hi Sahar. How was your first day? I think I remember every single moment. I, I what was did really. What you doing your first day? We did. It was the first day of shoot. It was the Paris meeting, uh -huh. which was nice because everyone was there. Yeah. It was overwhelming. Yeah. Because we were in that massive a big hall. Thing to go in on. But they're all great, aren't they? I, I yeah. learned so quickly yeah, doing it you all. You picked up. So quick. Yusuf, in time as always. Nathan. There are two mini comics about the teachers called The Teachers and Firsts. Are you also having regrets about signing up for this? It'll be a laugh, won't it? Quote from Fisayo Akiade, Mr. Ajayi. I think season two is great because you see two teachers who have very different approaches, but maybe have aspects of their personalities that would help one another which is really lovely to see. Hey, Isaac. Oh, hi, James. Um, uh, I, I was just thinking.
Did you want to come to that end of exams party tonight? Yeah. OK. <laughs> cool. <laughs> cool. And all your friends should come too, obviously. Sweet. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. See you there. Bye, Bye Isaac. Bye. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It is pretty interesting that from this moment on, all the characters are so on board with shipping Isaac with James, even though Isaac's sexuality has never been discussed, and Charlie even says his friends wouldn't understand because they're not gay all the way back in episode 1. Coming out is still treated as a big thing in this show, so it's kind of funny that everyone's just decided Isaac would be down to date James, even though he's never expressed anything to support the notion. Even James just seems to assume Isaac is also gay in episode 4. I could come out at the party to some of the rugby guys, so if it goes badly, we could just leave. Everyone. Quiet! Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Farouk. The start of Mr. Ajayi being into a man with authority. We'll now ask you to get into groups of four. We've been told to inform you that boys and girls cannot share rooms. Oh dear. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, we know. Heartbreaking, isn't it? Um, <laughs> for them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, for you. Right. Yeah. This girl is probably not a language student then. Also, I wonder which language Imogen is studying, if not French. I don't take French either. Ben's taking French since he was complimented by the French teacher last episode. Tao and Nick are likely doing Cantonese and French because of their parents, and who knows what Isaac is studying. Where is Tao? He really skipped this whole meeting just to get a haircut, buy flowers and make a dramatic entrance. <laughs> We've really given you the whole tour. But why are you saying that? Cut that out. <laughs> what the hell? Hi. Uh, these are for you. Quote from costume designer Adam D. Tao had a fairly strong look in the first season as well. He was quite bold with the colors and prints that he chose. But in the second season, of course, we have this transformation scene before he tells Elle how he feels. To understand that, we have to look at another scene first. There's that really cute flashback where you see young Tao and Charlie in their first year of school, and Tao says to Charlie, Have you seen the Romeo and Juliet movie from the 90s? It's one of my favorite movies. So the shirt that Tao wears post the makeover was kind of a reference to the film. The costume design from Romeo and Juliet was so memorable, and I wanted to bring that in. The kind of embroidery on the shirt, as well as the tailored trousers, go back to that style. What's happening right now? <laughs> I'm pretty sure everyone would be glad to find out that Tao's hair has now changed as well. Yes. Yes. <laughs> According to the Cosmopolitan article, exclusive go behind the scenes of Heart Super Season 2 with these never before seen photos. Tao's hairstyle was inspired by the main character of the film In the Mood for Love, which is one of Tao's favourite films. There's a poster of the movie on Tao's wall. Little rant time, but I'm actually so annoyed by how big the Tao hair discourse got and how adamant some people were that they wouldn't give Tao the time of day before he cut his hair. I hate when people see someone make a deliberate aesthetic choice that clearly takes time and effort to maintain and think they just don't know what they're doing and what message they're sending with their look. Elle got it. Elle liked the hair. Tao liked it. The show makes that very clear and people are still so relieved Tao can be hot now. As if that is of the utmost importance. Let the boy be weird. The hair does look nice though, but also just like everyone else's. Oh, I like you. Romantically. In a romantic way, not just a friend way! And I was wondering if you wanted to go on a date. Tonight. Why tonight? What if she had plans? Turns out she did have plans. I'd personally have given her a bit more room to get used to the idea, but um... I would say it worked out, I guess, but it definitely did not. You like me? She had really given up on that. It seems like part of her is annoyed that he's now suddenly all full on when she's already gone through the trouble of trying to distance herself. I guess I was sort of hoping... I've been sort of wondering if... you like me back? Uh, Dutch? <laughs> <laughs> well... So, tonight, I thought maybe we could go to the cinema. Okay. Oh, 
This cute cinema is the everyman Gerard's Cross. But I might save the day. Yeah, I might change the world. Hi. Two tickets for Tao Su? Do people still get physical movie tickets? I used to collect them and glue them in my scrapbook. Now I just have them on my phone for convenience. I guess this is another one of those old Hollywood romance things they do on the show. What are we seeing? It's a surprise. So that's two tickets for Moonrise Kingdom at 7.15. Did you do that on purpose just to mess with him, or...? Or not. That's my favourite movie. I know. But you hate that movie. Yeah, but I want to make this your dream day. There's a deleted scene that would have gone somewhere in here. The bonfire party was shot in Black Park Country Park, Wexham, Buckinghamshire, with around 200 extras. This definitely isn't legal, is it? This definitely doesn't feel legal. <laughs> All right, this isn't legal, is it? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Nope. Darcy's not replying to my messages. I'm gonna go find her. Not alcohol. I mean, there is alcohol if you want it, but if you don't, that's cool too. Um... <laughs> We're running. <laughs> Heartstopper is just always so determined to be the embodiment of this meme. Look after him, or you die. Tori. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I think she's got definitely those two sides to her. I think the person who really brings out her lighter side is Charlie. I think she's a, a real sucker for Charlie, basically. I think he's one of the only people in the world that she really, really cares about. She's very deadpan, um, seems emotionless, but I, I think she's like, what's the analogy? She's like a duck because above water, is it, or is it a swan? There's an analogy. Above water, they look serene and like, you know, a closed book, but underneath, there's a whole world of things going on. Okay. <laughs> What's up? I'm fine. Just a um, headache. We can leave if you want. I'm fine. I promise. Well, everyone seems to comment and laugh at how massive the popcorn and nachos are, and how tiny the drinks are as well. Not so average fangirl made a really good observation that the overboard size of the snacks really emphasized how much Tao is overdoing it on this date, blowing everything way out of proportion, putting all these big expectations on this one date, turning it a bit ridiculous in the process. You look really nice, by the way. But I think the the pining of Tao, as in Tao having a massive, massive crush, I think that's that's where I'm gonna really have fun with it. Like how I think it's gonna really hit him like a truck, um, and he's gonna be like, "Wow, oh, I don't know what to do here." And I'm looking forward to playing with that struggle as he tries to come to terms with his wonderful feelings uh, of love and desire. And I'm looking forward to bringing that to life. Why did you cut your hair? Well, it just looks better like this, doesn't it? I hope you didn't cut it for me. <laughs> Quote from article, William Gao embraces the cringe by Simran Hans for high snobiety. Gao channeled the awkwardness of a real-life cinema date he remembers going on. That didn't go to plan either. 
I made this joke before we went into the cinema, and it just fell flat on its face, he says. The joke, by the way, was a fart joke. I find farting hilarious, but she clearly didn't. It was his closing remark before they went into the screening, and its inelegance hung over them like a bad smell. When the film ended, Gao offered to walk his date to the bus stop. She was like, actually, I have to call someone. He remembers cringing. I was like, okay, I'm gonna go. Gao, who is 6'3", performs this story, crumpling his tall frame theatrically at its denouement. He is a natural comic, eagerly and endearingly embracing cringe. Just ask me for a lift next time. My mom can pick you up, it's really not a problem. I don't know why she didn't just ask. Maybe she was just embarrassed. Darcy's the most confident person I know. <laughs> Literally nothing embarrasses her. You sure about that? I'm you, just taking adorable pictures. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, no, you no, can't. No, okay, I won't take you. Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> okay, you win. You win. <laughs> you win. <laughs> Are you sure you want to come out to the rugby boys tonight? If you're not feeling well, I'm fine. See? Charlie knows it's a terrible idea. Just think about us being out as a couple in Paris. <laughs> Holding hands in the Louvre. Holding hands in, in the Louvre. Who are we? Get it right, Joe. Go on now. Quote from director A. Ross Lynn. They're such brilliant actors, Will and Yaz. There's this fantastic sequence I'm so pleased of in episode 3, where they go to watch a movie together. The awkwardness of their first date is unbearable, because you're just watching these two people wanting to hold hands, but they're afraid to. Then they do, and then it's the wrong thing. It's excruciating. Alice drew Tao and Elle dressed as Sam and Susie from Moonrise Kingdom for Halloween 2021. world do you still think that's possible in this situation? Are you just gonna show, you know guys I'm dating Charlie! I'm super bisexual actually! Right here? How you know, the showman, he, he always wants to uh, get into a bit of that drama, a bit of that action, he always wants to place himself in there when he's not, <laughs> he's not really should be there to be honest. The cinema sign is now broken. It's technically good movie. It was fine before. The mood has changed so drastically. I actually didn't spot this one. All credit to at yesfinnies on Twitter slash X for this tweet. I just think that's probably Wes Anderson's least technically good movie. Tao, you do not take a girl out to see her favorite movie knowing you hate it and then give her a lecture about why you hate it. Just... Eh? I mean, it all hinges on the romance between the two kids, which is so unbelievable anyway, because they meet and fall in love immediately. Mm. And like, 
They're kids, so obviously it's not going to last long term. Hmm. You two are also kids. You might be saying more than you think you're saying there. It's not my fave, but you love it, so... But if we're going on a date, we should do something we both enjoy. Like, maybe something art-related? Still want to go to this party? Yeah, sure. Costume designer Adam D on Elle's fashion. Through the first season, she gets a bit stronger. And then in season two, she has these friends who help her become her authentic self. And this gives her the freedom to think about her own style. At the bonfire party, the art college, and even in Paris, her fashion starts to reflect the wider world that she's experiencing. I just met this bitch in the corridor. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you invited them. Well, yeah. Stuff like that is gonna happen when you ask her out without warning day off and she's already made plans to go to a party the same night. She probably texted them before you asked her out. Yeah? They're my friends. I don't understand what I did wrong tonight. It's like you were trying to be a completely different person. You're the one who's completely different. You've gone off with your new friends and have forgotten I exist completely. You're the one who said we'd always put our friendship first. You promised. Well, I guess romance does ruin friendship. Quote from Joe Locke. The Tao and Elle story this season, I think, is my favorite in any story of the season. I think it's really gorgeously played out because I think there's this idea sometimes of Heartstopper that it just simplifies what teenage relationships are. With the Tao and L story, there's a lot of chewing and fraying, will they, won't they, but in a different way to what's Nick and Charlie's relationship, which I think is great. This Heartstopper is all about showing different types of relationships. Tao, how'd it go? But maybe he was just nervous. I'm fundamentally unlikable. Quote from executive producer Patrick Walters. Tao is one of those people who veers between really high self-worth in certain situations and then really low self-worth in other ways. He's grappling with his fear of abandonment, not being good enough, not being able to continue these relationships that nourish him. Don't say that, Tao. He was probably just trying to impress you. I liked the old Tao. I tried too hard. And I talk too much. I ruin everything. Tao, please don't say that. And even if something did happen, I would still mess it up like I always do with everything. I've liked him for so long, and it just hurts. All things considered, she did give up on this really fast. It's only been two months since Charlie's birthday on April 27th, and that's when Elle realized she likes Tao. If this is set in 2022, the year season one came out, GCSEs ended on June 28th. I don't want to feel like this anymore. Come here. I think sometimes, because I'm both trans and disabled, I often feel like sometimes I'm, I'm, if I'm playing a disabled role, I'm too trans. If I'm playing a trans role, I'm too disabled. And I didn't feel like that with Felix. I felt, I didn't feel like I had to push myself more to, you know, do scenes stood up or, um, you know, not be in my chair or anything like that. Um, it felt very much like everyone was sort of like do what you you want to do um so in the tent scene i'm not in my chair i'm sat with bell and yaz um and then in other scenes i am in my chair just because you know they're long days and it's just easier to be sat down so i don't fall over charlie hi Sorry, I'm gonna do that again. <laughs> At this point, Nick still finds Tori intense and intimidating. Where's Charlie? I, um, I lost him. Sorry. You said you'd look after him. Not very good at keeping your promises, are you? Ouch. Of course, Tori has no idea she's hitting him in way more places than intended with that one. 
There is a scene in Alice Osman's debut novel about Tori Spring, Solitaire, that takes place in the middle of Heartstopper Volume 4, that would be season 3 of the show, that is similar to this. This feels foreshadowing to Tori going off on Nick for leaving Charlie alone after an argument with him. We may actually see this scene next season. Solitaire is a very dark and depressing book and that event is only mentioned briefly in the Heartstopper series. It'll be interesting if the show will be a sort of middle ground between the versions of that part of the story. You don't look well. I'll find him. I promise. It seems she already regrets being harsh with him. So when I got Hearts Up at, the first email they said was like, welcome, blah, 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 like, thank you so much for accepting the role, whatever they would say. And then they said, um, uh, we know Bradley's autistic, is there any uh, requirements he would need? And I was a bit like, really? yeah, I was a bit like, wow. uh, and I, obviously it was my first job, so I didn't want to sound like a diva. When I should have, I should, it was not, it's not being a diva, it's yeah. just being, it's just having basic, like, extra spoon yeah. needs. Um, and I just like, no, nothing, thank you so much. <laughs> Which is, because it was my first joy, it's like, you've got, I was, I was very grateful to be in that position. So I was, I should, but I should have said some things. Um, so then when I went on set, it had, I already had, already had a positive like mindset around being on set because they've asked me if I needed, like needed any special requirements. And it's, it was kind of, it was, it kind of took me back. It was a bit like, okay. Um, but also when I was on set, I did, I did come across some, <laughs> some things. I just remember there was one day that, we were in like these woods and it was just like, it was really fun, it was a really fun day. Um, but it was evening and I just remember feeling really tired and just really like, oh my God, I need to go home. <laughs> a bit like, I've been in these woods for too long. And I'm like, but this is my job, but I've been in the woods for too long. And then I remember like um, going to the makeup chair, uh, the makeup and the makeup team is so nice in this job. They're so lovely. There's a makeup artist called Shorsha. And she just she just got me straight away from the from the get go. Like when she was cutting my hair, um, I was just like, I'm sorry if I go really silent. <laughs> and she was like, No, I get it. Um, because I whenever I get my hair cut, I go really silent because it's just very overwhelmed. I'm, I'm just like this. <laughs> but everyone like speaks to each other when they get the hair cut. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not being rude. I'm just I'm just yeah. give me a minute. Um, but she got me straight away. So Sasha was, um, amazing on the team. And I remember this day we were in the woods. We got back. And usually you would get like a D-rig, so you get like your makeup taken off, like whatever you had. And I just walked in and went, I need to go home. And I was like, I can't have my makeup off today. I need to get in that taxi. I'm going to go in that bath and I'm going to take off myself. Because yeah. sometimes it's like when you're lying in the makeup chair, they put like a, they wash it off and then it's, re it's really nice. When you're feeling it, it's really good. And then they put like a um, flannel on your face yeah. and they grab it. And I was just like, that's going to be too much for me today. Yeah. But thank you so much. Hope you see you in the morning. <laughs> What's up, mate? Yeah, yeah, I just, um, I just needed to talk to you guys about something. In what world would you still think this is the time and place for this discussion? You're bisexual, so you're gonna cheat on my brother. What's funny is, this is what Tori actually says about Nick's bisexuality in Solitaire when Michael Holden says he's pansexual, so he's a bit in love with everyone. Nick's bisexual, but he doesn't fancy everyone he meets. He's a bit Charlie-obsessed, to be honest. Are you sure you're not just gay? It seems from this screenshot posted by writer Lauren James, at Lauren Ellis James on Instagram, that she was consulted by Alice on something for episode 3 as Heartstopper Writer's Room's resident bisexual. And it's most likely about getting the stereotypes and internalized doubt about Nick's bisexuality correct and accurately represented. Lauren was also present for filming the episode. Aww, share with the group. Someone spits it out. It's fun, isn't it? Jack Barton, who plays David, posted this picture on Instagram, and it seems like they filmed something like these dark visions of Nick's dad here. But this doesn't have quite the same colour scheme, and Nick's dad hasn't been introduced yet at this point, so it doesn't really fit, but I don't know what else this could have been for. Maybe this might have been for the deleted scene with David before the party. Maybe David planted a seed of fear about their dad's reaction, and that started these imaginings. You promised you were gonna come out. Still lying. This is exactly why I didn't want to tell you. Nick, you see, you see things—not traumatic events, but you see things happening in his life that that really do sort of mess with his mental health and um, mess with the way that he sees himself and his life. And uh, I think that that's something that Hartsuber does handle beautifully because it's you know very very subtly written by Alice. 
um, and but still very positively and very, as Joe said, you know that everything's going to be okay at the end of the day. And that's, um, I think it's important for people, especially people who are going through tough times, to see a show where people who are like them, or even not like them, uh, but just people who are sort of going through tough times as well, but there's a, a sense of hope. Nick doesn't want to talk to you, Harry. Piss off. This is the first time Charlie ever stands up to his bullies, and he does it for Nick. Ben kisses Imogen because Nick and Charlie are watching. Also, today I learned that British guys call their closest buddies G. Thanks, Urban Dictionary. Oh, you're a star. Is he okay? Quote from Joe Locke. I said to Alice when she was writing season two, if you don't write me a scene with Olivia Coleman, I'm just going to quit. I think they took that to heart more than I meant it. Oh, he'll be fine. Just a bit of sunstroke, probably. I did tell him to put a hat on when he took Nanny out today. You know, just a bit of sunstroke, as if that is nothing to worry about. Do you mind if I stay for a bit, just to make sure he's okay? Nick's so lucky to have you, Charlie. Nick has the wrong side of the photo booth pictures on his wall in this scene. He has the right ones where they are kissing in other scenes. So. Remember our good Italian and Spanish friends Chiquito and Chucky from the dubs of season 1 episode 7 when Nick calls Charlie Char for the first time? Chiquito. Chucky. Well. Char. Char. Rest in peace, Chucky and Chiquito. You will be dearly missed. Although, just imagine Nick calling Charlie Chucky in that moment in episode 8. Chucky. Mean to you. I mean, I would be skeptical of your potential for success with that, but Charlie would still probably have better moves than Tar, to be fair. I so I told her, but I couldn't. Tonight just wasn't the night. I promised. When we went to the beach, I told you I was going to come out. I've just been finding it so hard. You didn't promise anything. I think there's this idea that when you're not straight, you have to tell all your friends and family immediately. Like you owe it to them, but you don't. Now, I don't want to go too much into what happened to Kit Connor because it sucks and I don't like how every interview lately asks him about it, but there's an undeniable parallel here to his personal experience. In case you somehow didn't hear about it, Kit came out as bisexual on Twitter before deleting his account permanently while they were filming season 2. He felt pressured to come out because people were speculating about his personal life and accusing him of queer baiting when he had specifically said he didn't want to label himself publicly. It must have been a really strange experience going to work every day doing this coming out storyline when he didn't get to come out on his own terms in real life. You know, we're still all so young and to start sort of speculating about our sexualities and, and maybe pressuring us to come out, you know, when maybe we're not ready. Or, I mean, for me, I just feel like I'm perfectly, you know, confident and comfortable in my sexuality, but I don't feel the need to really, you know, I'm, I'm not 
too big on label uh, labels and things like that. I'm not massive about that, and I don't feel like I need to label myself, especially not publicly. Quotes from Kit Connor. There were definitely points where I was doing season two and saying certain lines, and I thought, this is good. This is how it should be. This is the message that we want to be sending. The show we're doing is really setting blueprints for people to know how to treat these delicate situations and how to make people feel safe and comfortable. It felt like certain people didn't quite understand the show and the original message that we were trying to portray in season one. So if that's the case, then we'll just keep hammering it home in season two and hope that people listen. It's regrettable what happened to me. I think it was a bit disappointing the reaction that I got in just trying to be myself and trying to discover myself and putting boundaries up. But despite that, I was still happy. Maybe we should forget the coming out plan for a while. Quote from Joe Locke. Charlie really understands Nick's feelings, and he understands the difficulty of what Nick has to do or wants to do. But I think they have this deep love for each other that Charlie will always just be there for Nick no matter what, no matter how hard it is for Nick. Charlie just cares about Nick's feelings. In an ideal world, Charlie would scream to the rooftops about their relationship, but he cares so much about Nick that he wants it to be the most painless and perfect way for him. You sure you're okay with it? Yeah. Obviously, I want you to come out when and how you want to. And if that takes a long time, that's completely okay. I sure hope people heard that line this time. But I guess part of me just wants everyone to know you're my boyfriend. And that's the end of episode 3. Thank you so much for a thousand subscribers. It's probably very rare to get to a thousand subs without a single nasty comment, but you've all been so lovely, so thank you. Off to Paris next week. 